Good morning. morning. Welcome. If you're new here among us, my name is Gene. I serve here at C3 Church as your lead pastor. And I have kind of a little pre-announcement. It's kind of special today. It's not what you think. It's special to me. (laughs) So I told you about the turkeys, right? And we found them. Found a whole bunch of turkeys for Thanksgiving, so there was no need to panic. We didn't need to have fear about not being able to get a turkey. And here's what happens in my household. My wife's turkey is so good, and so guys, learn something here. It's so good that I have to have it every Thanksgiving. It's not Thanksgiving if I don't have her turkey the way she does it. It's very important to me. So if I go to your house, let's say, for Thanksgiving, and I eat your turkey, a redo has nothing to do with you. It's not about you. Maybe you made a good turkey. She just makes it a certain very special way, and the stuffing's really, really good. So we did that yesterday, and we had a whole bunch of extra. I had a hard time buttoning my shirt today. But there's a whole bunch of extra. It's upstairs. So after the service, we normally have fellowship. We break bread. But you got to try this turkey. They were eating it yesterday with no gravy. That's how, like, soft it was. Yeah, we're going to talk about edible birds today, too, which is going to be interesting. I'll get there, and then you'll go, oh, that's what he's doing with that. But not right away. So I wonder, speaking of highly edible birds, if you remember the story of Chicken Little. Remember that story? Not like the new Disney version, but like the original version. Or like maybe it was Grimm's Fairy Tales. I looked it up because it came to mind during this message, during the week. And I said, oh, let me look up the story. Maybe I'll tell it. It was really difficult because there are many different versions of that story. And the farther back you go, the more violent it gets, it seems, which is kind of interesting. So I'm going to tell you a cross-section of that story, the basics. The basics are this. You have Henny Penny, and she's in the yard, and an acorn drops on her head, presumably from a tree. But Henny Penny just jumps to conclusions, automatically assumes that the sky is falling, the world is going to end. So she sets out to tell the king, another point of arrogance here. She knows so much that she's got to inform the king. So she sets out, and on her way, she runs into Ducky Lucky. What's going on? The sky's falling. The earth is going to end. we got to go tell the king. Well, Ducky Lucky is gullible. So yeah, we do. Falls for it. So now you have Henny Penny and Ducky Lucky going to tell the king that the world is going to end. They run into Goosey Lucy. What's up? World's going to end. Sky is falling. we got to tell the king. Yeah, let's go. Goosey Lucy's gullible too. So now you have Henny Penny, Ducky Lucky, and Goosey Lucy going to see the king. Tell him that the sky is falling. They run into Turkey Lurkey. Also very gullible. Wow, so what's going on? we got to tell the king. Henny Penny, Ducky Lucky, Goosey Lucy, and Turkey Lurkey now are going to see the king. The sky is falling. Well, they run into Foxy Loxy. Foxy Loxy has two things not in common with the four highly edible birds. Foxy Loxy is not a bird. He's not gullible. He doesn't fall for it. He sees an opportunity here. So he says, oh, I know where the king is. Let me show you. Now, depending on what version, it changes. In the milder versions, it's just Turkey Lurkey who goes in. I guess it's Thanksgiving. And gets killed. Turkey Lurkey gets it, and they all run away. In other versions, the other three birds, they die. They get gobbled up. And what's funny is, Henny Penny actually gets away and forgets about the whole thing. Interesting. So the one who started it all, came to assumptions, got everybody riled up, is the only one who gets away and forgets all about it, doesn't even tell the king. So in this story, we learn a lesson about the dangers of listening to and being led by the wrong leaders. We're going to talk about that today. So we're in the rest of the story. We looked at Ecclesiastes, and we saw that there was about two main themes. We looked at one theme, all is vanity, all is vanity, chabel, like Abel, 
It's all smoke. It goes away anyway. So fear God. That was the important takeaway. We looked at that teaching about fear in the Bible. If you didn't watch it or weren't here, go watch it. It's an example of a very, very common false teaching spread by even very famous teachers. The Bible does not say fear not 365 times, a fraction of that. It says fear the Lord way more. We looked at the importance of that and how it can keep us from sin, fear of the Lord. So today, we're going to look at the other side of the coin, what not to fear. We saw a little bit of it in Jesus' teaching, but I'm going to take you to more teachings about it. What not to fear and what not to get riled up about. That's what we're going to look at today. First, let's go back to Ecclesiastes and get the other main theme. Ecclesiastes 1.9. History merely repeats itself. It has all been done before. Nothing new is under the sun. Or there's nothing new under the sun. Uh, whatever, I have my own version. You get the point. <clears throat> That's an NLT there. We have been looking at wisdom literature, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, both attributed to Solomon. But some scholars argue that Ecclesiastes was not written by him. It's often attributed to him, but he's not exactly named in that book like he is in others. So if we go to the very next book of the Bible, Song of Songs or Song of Solomon, we see that he is mentioned in that book. Now, to summarize briefly, we're not going to go there today. We're going to concentrate on something you didn't expect. But it's like love poetry, eight chapters, a female voice and a male voice going back and forth. gets kind of interesting. Check it out in your spare time. It's an easy read. It's kind of short. He's mentioned there. But scholars say, no, nah, I don't think he wrote it. And so depending on what copy of the Bible you have, it'll say Song of Solomon, and some will say Song of Songs. So there's some debate about this. Now, if you're on the side that Solomon didn't write it, then you're calling this pseudopographical. It's fun to say. It just means that it's attributed, it's a book attributed to someone who didn't write it. And a lot of people don't understand. This shouldn't scare you. Because this is very common in ancient literature. People would do it in the voice of someone or in the inspiration of someone. Very, very common back then. I'm going to show you some things here. So most scholars today believe that Song of Songs and Ecclesiastes are in that category. Now, what a lot of people don't know is that we see this in the New Testament as well. It gets interesting. So we're going to do show and tell today. And we'll pull up a pic of Hebrews. Is that the next one we got? Yeah. But this is the special thing. Now, I was going to bring in all my Bibles, but my wife wouldn't let me. And then I thought, well, what if I pass them around and one of you picks your nose and touches my Bible? <laughs> Ew, yeah, that would be you. you know, so anyway, this is much lighter than bringing in the boxes of Bibles. And you can all see it very easily. So this is from a 1526 Tyndale Bible. It's not original. It's like a photocopy type thing. But you'll notice something here, and it may be different from your Bible. This is from Paul to the Hebrews. That's interesting. Most modern Bibles don't say that. Why? Well, may have been pseudepigraphical back in the day. It's attributed to Paul. Some think, ah, somebody else writing down one of Paul's sermons. But if you're very familiar with Paul's letters, and you read them a lot, it reads very, very differently, and it doesn't have any of his signatures. Normally, he signs at the beginning of the letter, Paul, an apostle or slave of Christ Jesus, appointed by the will of God, not by men, right? None of that is there. He also often signs off at the end of the letter. Doesn't do that there either. It lacks some of the phrases he very, very commonly uses. None of them are there either. So after a while, scholars are like, yeah, let's not add that Paul thing in there. Also, a lot of people don't know that these headers are not in the originals. They don't exist. So it's really not that important. So this is someone adding something to the text and giving you an idea that Paul wrote it. But it's very, very, very common. Now, this is interesting. Tyndale Bible is the first copy from the Greek or translation from the Greek into the English language or the English language we 
would recognize. Wycliffe or Wycliffe was in the late 1300s. Technically the first, but that comes from Latin, and it is Middle English. It's very, very hard to read. So that's what you're looking at there, kind of ornate and beautiful. Uh, first English, non-authorized translation. Got him in a little bit of trouble. He got killed, actually, for doing it. Long story. We can discuss that at Bible study. Now, as far as Solomon is concerned, we're going to look at other books attributed to him today. The same way Ecclesiastes is. Now, it's worth mentioning here, Psalm 72 is attributed to him, but the early church had a book. We still have it today. Psalms of Solomon, clearly attributed to him. And I'll explain why it's not there today. Or I'll tell you that it's not there today. But today we'll be looking at two different books that you may not have in your Bible. You may, depending on how old it is or other things. Sirach and Wisdom of Solomon. A lot of Christians don't know what those books are. But these fall into a totally different category today than they did in the early church. This is really interesting stuff. So we're looking at the rest of the story in the series. And we've noticed that there are parts of the story that have been redacted. They've been taken out, whether it's just in church, they just don't say certain things, they leave things out. But there are also whole books of the Bible that have been redacted by scholars. So what they don't realize, and here's a table of contents. I want to show you something here. It's a little hard to read, but I'll give you the basic gist, and you can look at it online later. If you're over there, I have to do it backwards from what I can see here, that is the Bible of the early church, give or take a few books here and there, depending on where you're at, all right? So those are the books you're reading from. And they did for the first 300-ish years, so about 405, until a fellow named Jerome came along. And he decided, ooh, I want to make a copy in Latin. So that was all in Greek. I want to do it in Latin. People are speaking Latin now. So then, middle column, around 405, that's the Latin Bible. And it gets a little bit shorter. But that is the authorized version of the church. I want you to understand something. This is before denominations in 405. You don't have them yet. It doesn't happen until the big split, the Great Schism in 1054, the Orthodox and Catholic Church split off, and then you have all these other branches later on, way before. So these are the books that they're reading from, and this goes all the way into the mid-1800s. The King James contains all of these books. And if you're saying mine doesn't, you got the redacted one. The original, the 1611 King James, has all of them in there, including to up until the mid-1800s or so. Then, modern scholarship comes along and says, ah, we're going to take a bunch out. <laughs> and that's our Bible over there, or most of us. So we'll get into that at Bible study a little more. But I want you to understand this, because a lot of people rail against reading from any of those extra books. But think, think. That's what we do here at C3. Think. For the first 1,800 years of Christianity, the majority of it, they're reading from those books. Think. So it's only the last like 100, 150 years have they decided, nah, we're not going to read from them anymore. So they got it wrong. And all of a sudden, we got it right. By the way, this is the Old Testament. This is the Old Testament. So it's not the New Testament. The New Testament and all these Bibles looks pretty much the same. So today, I want to concentrate on two of those redacted books, Sirach first. First, I want to do something interesting, a little more show and tell, just to show you. I will show you what I'm saying. Don't believe me, check it out for yourself. We're going to look at a 1611 King James. That's my 1611 King James. I didn't write and read in it. I just wanted to point that out. That is a reference. If you have references in your Bible, what it's doing is it's pointing to other places in the Bible that that author is probably thinking about, referencing, or directly quoting. If we zoom in, we see that right there in Romans, that was Romans, it's saying this is a reference to the book of wisdom. Qualifies it. Kind of interesting. If we keep going, this is even more interesting. That is a 1560 Geneva Bible. Oh, yes, there's an English version way before the King James. This is the Bible. This is wisdom in that Bible. This is the Bible that the Puritans came over on the Mayflower with. They didn't like the King James because they felt, well, he was kind of arrogant. Think about it. You name a Bible after yourself? 
I like the King Jesus version better, right? So, and they had problems because they felt he wasn't authorized to do it. Should have went through Parliament and all that stuff. 1560 Geneva, and here you can see in Wisdom of Solomon, it has reference going back to books like Romans, or forward <laughs> to books like Romans and Wisdom that we're going to take a look at today. First, we'll look at Sirach. And so I think that's going to be the next thing. There you go. This is interesting. We're going to keep that up. <laughs> this is in, very interesting, a 1537 Matthew's Bible. 1537. It's a little harder to read. It's going back further and further to so get closer to that Middle English period. So Sirach is also called Ecclesiasticus. You know, here's what's really interesting. I'll give you a little bit more. We're going to do a little teachy today, but then I'll get to the preaching. This is really interesting. There was a council of hippo, hungry, hungry hippos. It's a place in northern Africa in 393 AD. And that is where they came up with the canon of scripture, really, one of the first times. And so all these books, including Ben Sira, Sirach, are listed. And here's the interesting thing. At this council, they didn't delineate and call them what some Bibles will today, Apocrypha or Deuterocanonical, which is like second scripture. They did not delineate. They verified this book is scripture in the early church. I didn't make it up. This is what happens. Look up that Council of Hippo. So it's very, very important because it shows us what the very, very early church considered scripture. That's what they thought of it as. Now, they also validated this book a second time. I believe it's the Council of Carthage in 397. So it's Really validated everywhere, all around Christianity. Super interesting, along with Wisdom of Solomon. And remember, this is before any of the denominational divisions that we have today. It's just Christianity in its purest form. They're all basically on the same page here. Now, it's also worth noting, this is why I kept it up. If you have good eyesight, you see the word Jesus there. That's kind of interesting because that's the guy's name, his grandfather's name that he's translating from. Ben Sirach, Jesus Ben Sirah, so like Jesus, the son of Sirach. So not the same Jesus, not the Jesus God. So basically the book starts with a prologue, it's what you're seeing there, and he's talking about, like we talked about in the series, the difficulty of making translations from one language to another. But the main theme here, it's 51 chapters, is fear God. It's huge. It's just the theme of the book, really. And it ends with this prayer of thanks. But for the most part, it's walking in his commands, leads up fear God, then yeah, walk in his commands. Good idea. And that pretty much summarizes it. A good summary verse, actually, Sirach 34, 14. Fear the Lord, and you'll have nothing else to fear. If your trust is in him, you'll never act like a coward. Like Kenny Penny, right? <laughs> so today I want to focus on wisdom. I'm going to give you a little survey, a tour of wisdom, and then we'll, we'll get to my point here. Now, it's worth noting that many early church fathers, St. Augustine included, quoted from this book, regarded it as scripture. Interesting. And we're going to see today, so did Paul probably in the New Testament. I'll show you some verses. So there are three main sections, and if we look within them, we see this. Wisdom 1.1. Love righteousness, you rulers of the earth. Think of the Lord in goodness and seek him with sincerity of heart, because he is found by those who do not put him to the test and manifests himself to those who do not distrust him. For perverse thoughts separate people from God, and when his power is tested, it exposes the foolish, because wisdom will not enter a deceitful soul, or dwell in a body enslaved to sin. Sounds kind of familiar to a lot of other scriptures, or if you don't believe they are, other parts of the Bible that we read. Worth noting that we see some in chapter 1, some verses that are really similar, and in some of these older Bibles, they're saying that they're quoting it when the people mock Jesus on the cross. So he's talking about how fools think. It highlights, chapter 2, how the evil people see the godly. That's what's going on there when Jesus is on the cross. Chapters 3, 4, and 5, hope for the godly versus peril for the ungodly. Chapter 4 sounds just like Isaiah 57, 1 through 2. It explains why these innocent people die young. What's going on here? So it gives us that same frame of references. Chapter 6, instructions to kings and rulers. 
You're going to be judged more harshly by God for what you do. And that sounds a lot like James 3.1. Dear brothers and sisters, not many of you should become teachers in the church, for we who teach will be judged more strictly. There's being judged again. We talked about that topic too. This is going to Christians, Christian teachers. So a lot of people don't realize that. There are a lot of references to this book, and oftentimes it'll sound just like James. James is probably quoting from it or has it in mind. It'll sound a lot like Jesus. Jesus uses a lot of this or probably has it in mind. Then wisdom is personified as a, as a woman. Now, this sounds just like Proverbs 8. I'll read some of it to you. Wisdom 6.12. Wisdom is radiant and unfading, and she is easily discerned by those who love her and is found by those who seek her. She hastens to make herself known to those who desire her. One who rises early to seek her will have no difficulty, for she will be found sitting at the gate. If you read Proverbs a lot, that sounds familiar. Chapter 7 and 8, it's about... It's King Solomon's love for wisdom, again, personified as a woman. He prays for women. Interestingly, he also calls the temple that he built a copy of the heavenly tent. Sounds exactly like Hebrews 8, 5. Then, towards the end, 10 through 19, it's wisdom found from Adam to Moses, from Genesis to Exodus. <laughs> Special points on denouncing idol worship, anything other than God, or specifically making these idols and praying to them like they did back then. Now, on idol worship, I want to read something to you. And to those of you who read the New Testament a lot, I want you to try to think of what it sounds like. What does this remind me of? Now, as we read it, and keep in mind, this is an NRSV, it's at a much higher reading level, so I don't use it on a Sunday. All right, so they didn't have like an easy-to-read version of these things. So it's going to be technically different because you're looking at different translations. And I just want you to look at the broad point. If you know your New Testament, especially Paul, I'll give you a hint, really well, it should bring something to mind. Wisdom 3.1, for all people who were ignorant of God were foolish by nature, and they were unable from the good things that are seen to know the one who exists, nor did they recognize the artisan while paying heed to his works. But they supposed that either fire or wind or swift air or the circle of the stars or turbulent water or the luminaries of heaven were gods that rule the world. If through delight in the beauty of these things people assume them to be gods, let them know how much better than these is their Lord. For the author of beauty created them. And if people were amazed at their power and working, let them perceive from them how much more powerful is the one who formed them. For from the greatness and beauty of created things comes a corresponding perception of their creator. So the truth about God should be obvious by the observation of his creation. Remind you of anything. Yeah, you got it. Check this out. Romans 1.18, but God shows his anger from heaven against all sinful, wicked people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Now, they know the truth about God because he has made it obvious to them. For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and the sky. Through everything God made, they can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature. So they have no excuse for not knowing God. Yes, they knew God, but they wouldn't worship him as God or even give him thanks. And they began to think up foolish ideas of what God was like. As a result, their minds became dark and confused. Claiming to be wise, they instead became utter fools. So Paul here probably has wisdom in mind or maybe quoting a little bit of it. And this is why the older Bibles reference him. There it is. So in Romans, they're saying, reference, this is what Paul is referencing. Interesting. That's not in our Bibles anymore, but it was then. So they had this understanding about it. If we keep reading, we're going to see some more similarities. So I'll go the other way. Romans 1.23. Instead of worshiping the glorious ever-living God, they worshiped idols made to look like mere people and birds and animals and reptiles. So God abandoned them to do whatever shameful things their hearts desired. 
As a result, they did vile and degrading things with each other's bodies, and instead of worshiping the glorious, ever-living God, they worshiped idols made to look like mere people and birds and animals and reptiles. So God abandoned them to do whatever shameful things their hearts desired. As a result, they did vile and degrading things with each other's bodies. They traded the truth about God for a lie, so they worshiped and served the things God created instead of the Creator Himself, who is worthy of eternal praise. Amen. Now, if we go back and hop around wisdom a bit and we put it together, here's what happens. Wisdom 11.15, a return for their foolish and wicked thoughts, which lead them astray to worship irrational serpents and worthless animals, you sent upon them a multitude of irrational creatures to punish them. Wisdom 12.27, for when in their suffering they became incensed at those creatures that they had thought to be gods, being punished by means of them, they saw and recognized as the true God, the one that whom they had before refused to know. Told you, a little hard to read. Therefore, the utmost condemnation came upon them. Hop to Wisdom 14, 12. For the idea of making idols was the beginning of fornication, and the invention of them was the corruption of life. Paul continues in Romans, Romans 1, 26. That is why God abandoned them to their shameful desires. Even the women turned against the natural way to have sex and instead indulged with sex with each other. And the men, instead of having normal sexual relations with women, burned with lust for each other. Men did shameful things with other men, and as a result of this sin, they suffered within themselves the penalty they deserved. Since they thought it was foolish to acknowledge God, he abandoned them to their foolish thinking and let them do things that should never be done. Their lives became full of every kind of wickedness, sin, greed, hate, envy, murder, quarreling, deception, malicious behavior, and gossip. They are backstabbers, haters of God, insolent, proud and boastful. They invent new ways of sinning, and they disobey their parents. They refuse to understand, break their promises, are heartless, have no mercy. They know God's justice requires that those who do these things deserve to die. If they do them anyway, worse yet, they encourage others to do them too. Does that remind you of anything? Today. (laughs) Reminds me of today every time I read it. I want you to think again with me. We're going to do some thinking. It's going to hurt a little bit, but that's okay. Think. Paul is writing this 2,000-ish years ago about things that happened 2,000 years before him. Past tense. But it sounds like he's talking about today. Why? Because there is nothing new under the sun. Ecclesiastes 1.9, history merely repeats itself. It has all been done before. Nothing under the sun is truly new. Sometimes people say, here's something new, but actually it is old. Nothing is ever truly new. We don't remember what happened in the past, and in future generations, no one will remember what we are doing now. He's talking about behaviors. Let's be clear about that, because right, we have laptops. They're new. Not talking about that. What we do, what human nature is all about. So again, the Bible tells us there's nothing new under the sun about our human nature, what people are doing, what people are doing to each other, to themselves. Not new. We learn this from the Word of God. History simply repeats itself. And here's the problem. If we're Christians, we should know this. It's all over the Bible. The point is made. And if you know the Bible well, You know the Old Testament. I mean, we're reading through it together. You're seeing it. It's crazy. Some of the stuff happening in there is nuts, if we're being honest. Crazy. Yet, here's the problem. So many people calling themselves Christians are fear mongers. They're fear mongers. It's unbelievable. Trying to get everybody all riled up. Yes, we should fear God. But they're not saying that. I can't remember the last time I saw that posted on the internet. Fear God, and that's the meme, that's it. No. What? So it's interesting, but they're posting all these things, getting people all like the turkeys and me, right? Watching the news, and I'm worried I can't even get a turkey. So my wife proves it to me, buys like 10. That's unbelievable. Fear mongering. Like Chicken Little. Prideful gossips. Assuming that they can even inform our king. 
Yet our king has told us exactly what he's going to do. We know what's going to happen. We know justice will be done. Jesus is the justice. That's it. But yet they say, what are we going to do? Read your Bible. (laughs) Love everybody and wait for Jesus to come back and take care of everything else. Pretty simple. (laughs) I saw an uh, internet modern adaptation of the chicken little story. And it was pretty good. Now, in this one, Henny Penny has a laptop. What happens is, reading the laptop, reads a news story that tells her the sky is falling. World's going to end. Sky is falling. So, same sequence happens. I'm not going to go through the names again. It's kind of hard. <laughs> but same sequence ends up happening. In this version, I was surprised because the modern version, I was like, ooh, they went there. They all get gobbled up. They all get gobbled up. It's going to get canceled, watch. But they all get gobbled up. And then it cuts away when you turn the page to Foxy Loxy sitting against a tree. He's got a big old belly because he's got all those birds in there. He has a laptop on his lap. And he says, I got them. They fell for it. Interesting. You see, those spreading all these rumors and speculations with this fear trying to get you all riled up, they're predators. They're predators. And the people continuing the gossip, the other birds spreading it around, they're working for those predators. There's nothing true except what's in here. That's the only thing you should be spreading. Fear. They're afraid. They're afraid. You know, anger, it's just a symptom of fear. They're afraid, and they want to drag you down with them. They want to steal your joy. Can't let them do that. So just to be clear, we are to fear the Lord. Let's look at Jesus here. Let's, but pay attention now in this light to the verses. We looked at them last week, fear God, but look at them the other way now. Luke 12, 4, dear friends, don't, don't be afraid of those who want to kill your body. They cannot do any more to you after that. But I'll tell you whom to fear. Fear God who has the power to kill you and then throw you into hell. Yes, he's the one to fear. Not these people and all this stuff that's been going on forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever. ever. No, stop and stop getting everybody riled up about it. Because here's the thing, and it's a question we have to ask ourselves. Don't answer. Just think. Do I believe this? Do I believe in God? Sounds kind of funny, right? Like, of course. No, I'm a pastor. I'm going to tell you something. That's not an of course. I know a lot of people. They don't believe it. They've been coming to church their whole lives, and they don't really believe it. Really believe it. I can tell. What you do says more about what you believe than anything you can ever say. I can tell by what people are doing, what they really believe. Because if you have fear of the Lord, ooh, that's scary. I know, like the nanny cam, I know he can see me all the time. And if I believe that, that's really going to change everything. It's also going to change my response to these fools running around, fear-mongering. Whatever. What are we going to do? Love people. Go die and be with Jesus. <laughs> like the apostles, the disciples, everybody before us, the saints. What do you think they did? What was their response? Like Thomas says, we're going to go and die with Jesus before he goes to Jerusalem. <laughs> so if you believe it, though, don't you trust him? Don't you trust in his word? He's got it, not us. We don't got anything. If you trust him, we'll just obey his commands. I don't know how many times it's said, if you love me, it's Oliver John, if you love me, you will obey my commands. If you don't obey my commands, be afraid. I want to give you context. I've done this before recently. First Peter, we read it all the way through at Bible study. Five chapters, not a big commitment, it took maybe a half hour. But there were a lot of lifelong Christians in the room who were like, says that? 
Yeah, it says that. This is the context. First Peter, written to Christians under heavy persecution. Nero was around that time, the emperor. We know about Nero. Probably really more Second Peter, but because of what First Peter says, we get a clue. They are literally being burned alive. Burned alive. They're not using like religious exemptions to get out of doing things. <laughs> They're using it to get into things like fire. They're not denying Christ. Whole families, women, children, babies, everybody. What are we going to do? 1 Peter 4.12, Dear friends, don't be surprised at the fiery trials you are going through as if something strange were happening to you. Instead, be very glad as if something strange is. Be very glad for these trials make you partners with Christ in suffering. These trials are making you more like him because that's what he did. He died on a cross. So, yeah, you should expect that too. Jesus says that too. Deny yourself, pick up your cross, then follow me. They're prerequisites. Be ready. There's no bait and switch going on here. So that you will have wonderful joy, the wonderful joy of seeing his glory when it is revealed to all the world. So what if we're all getting burned alive, right? Oh, Pastor Gene, they burned my family. Well, they're going to get a crown of righteousness for that. And because they were martyred, they're going to get to raise with Jesus first and reign with him for the first thousand years. That's what it says. And so he did. Heather noted, I was talking about a lot of the history of the early martyrs, Polycarp, all these people. Well, you're martyred. It's like they're having like a death contest. Yeah, they're writing back and forth about these guys. He died a glorious death for Christ. It was glorious. The joy awaiting us in heaven. Don't let the world steal that joy, even unto death. That's what this says. No matter how bad things seem, and here's the thing, Satan, 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, is the god of this world. That's what it says. Satan's the ruler of this world. He's a liar and he's a thief. And you cannot let him steal your joy. I mentioned Hebrews earlier. I want to give you some context. I went through it a few times over the past maybe a few months, but it's good to know. So Hebrews, we don't know who wrote it. It's probably a sermon. It reads like that. So when you read Hebrews, I know it's 13 chapters. You really should read it all the way through. You should also be familiar with the Old Testament. So basically what's happening here is you have Jewish Christians, Jewish Christians, right? So at first, it's a Jewish sect. Jesus and all the apostles are Jewish. Well, they decide to believe in Jesus, and they start getting persecuted for it. So the whole point of Hebrews, if you want to summarize it, Jesus is superior to all of the Old Testament things. So he's the fulfillment of all these things the Jewish people used to do. He's fulfilled it. He's replaced it. That's it. It's all about Jesus. So don't go away. Don't go back to Judaism. Stay in Christianity. I want you to think about this for a second. Modernize this in your mind. Let's say that's you. Hebrews 10.32, think back to those early days when you first learned about Christ. Remember how you remained faithful even though it meant terrible suffering. Sometimes you were exposed to public ridicule. Somebody made fun of you on the net. And you were beaten. And sometimes you helped others who were also suffering the same things. You suffered along with those who were thrown into jail. And when all you owned was taken from you, you accepted it with joy. Read that again. I checked the Greek, too. It's pretty accurate. It's an NLT, but it's where they kind of nail it. It's that arpagmon word. It actually, if you know Greek, it should make you think of the action of Adam stealing from the cross. Thought it not robbery. Also in Philippians chapter 2, that word is used. So it's, it's robbery. When they robbed from you. So it actually, the connotation in the Greek is even better because it's unjust. It's robbery. They took your stuff, doesn't belong to them, and they took it, all of it, all your stuff, and you accepted it with joy. But it sounds like Jesus, doesn't it? If someone sues you, 
for what? Your shirt? Give him your coat? Sounds just like Jesus. It's consistent here. You accepted it with joy. Why? You knew there are better things waiting for you that will last forever. I hear, what are we going to do, Gene? What are we going to do? Well, Christians, Christians, the Word of God applies to us. Christians, if you get all your stuff taken away, accept it with joy because you know what's waiting for you. I'm just reading the Word of God. That's it. Unfortunately, it doesn't sound normal, right? You won't hear that in church a lot on Sunday. I've been a Christian for a while now. I've never heard that verse in church. That's sad because it gives us the key to enduring in our suffering. Keep your mind on Jesus. That's the key. So there's the Word versus the world, and you can't let the world get you hyped up. These people are working for the world. Who's the God of the world? They're trying to get you to forget about your joyful anticipation in Christ. That's everything. That's it. That's it. None of the other stuff should be important if we're truly in Christ. The more in the Word I am, the more time I spend with Jesus, the more time I'm in prayer, the less and less and less I care about my stuff. I got it in perspective. Not perfect. Not perfect. I care about my family. But the key is I'm not worshiping it. My joy is in Jesus. So, real quickly, how do we tell who belongs to the Word or the world? Well, what you do says everything about what you believe. We judge a tree by its fruit. Galatians 5.19. When you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery. But listen to this. Hostility, quarreling, jealousy, Outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division. Nobody talks about that. Envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. Let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. What? This is the word of God here. I did not make this up. So let's just take the ones that we do and then not point at the ones that we point at other people for doing and put them on an even playing field like it does right here in the Word of God. It doesn't say first, right? The sexually immoral people, they're going to hell first. They're worse. It does not say that. <laughs> so those quarreling, creating division, I would add in the church, anything like that, outbursts of anger, anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. Ooh. But, check this out, the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and another one we don't like, self-control. Peace, love, joy. That's what's important. This tells us who we should be listening to and who we should not be listening to. So if someone is coming at you with anger in a divisive tone, who cares about stuff like that, get behind me, Satan. Get behind me. I'm not going to let you steal my joy. Jesus is able. He is more powerful. He's at the top of my priority list and clearly at the bottom of yours. So get behind me, Satan. Done with it. Turn it off. Real quick, how do we do this, though? Some people are like, Gene, that's really hard. Well, I told you. Colossians 3, starting at verse 1, says we should have our minds always, not like some of the time on Sunday, always fixed on Jesus, always fixed on heavenly things. So perspective. We get some tools. God gives us tools. I want to go back to wisdom really quick. Tell me if this sounds like something, and then we'll close. Wisdom 5.15. But the righteous live forever, and their reward is with the Lord. 
The Most High takes care of them. Therefore, they will receive a glorious crown and a beautiful diadem from the hand of the Lord, like a crown with jewels on it. Because with his right hand he will cover them, and with his right arm he will shield them. The Lord will take his zeal and his whole armor, and will arm all creation to repel his enemies. He will put on righteousness as a breastplate, and wear impartial justice as a helmet. He will take holiness as an invincible shield, and sharpen stern wrath for a sword. And creation will join with him to fight against his frenzied foes. That one's too easy. The armor of God. Little variations. Paul's talking about fighting spiritual battles. Spiritual battles. I'm talking about fighting. Ephesians 6, 13. Therefore, put on every piece of God's armor so you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then after the battle, you will still be standing firm. Stand your ground, putting on the belt of truth and the body armor of God's righteousness. For shoes, put on the peace that comes from the good news so that you will be fully prepared. In addition to all of these, hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery arrows of the devil. Put on salvation as your helmet and take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. That's how. The armor of God helps us guard the fruit of the Spirit. Guards our love, guards our joy, guards our peace our kindness, our goodness, our self-control. Only Jesus can bring true joy. Let me pray for you. Lord, I pray for everyone who came in here today. Fill them with your Holy Spirit. Completely convince them that your word is true. Jesus is coming back, and he's going to take care of everything. Put on the armor of God. Protect against all these schemes of the devil, Lord. Protect this flock. Be with this flock. Bring them peace. Bring them joy this week. Show them your love so that they can extend it to others. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.